it's just really great to be here and and happy to talk about this paper. It's been a little while since I <laughs> um, published this one and got to talk about it, um, but it's it's one of my favorites, so um, I'm happy to be here. Um, so the paper we're going to talk about today is um, one of a series of papers that we did as part of this study, um, particularly looking at how uh, journal impact factor is getting used in um, review, promotion, and tenure evaluations. Um, so just quickly talk about why we might want to do that. Um, we hear a lot about the, kind of the use or the misuse of journal impact factor um, in RPT processes. Um, in particular, people refer to kind of the dominance of this metric in academic evaluations and why that might have a lot of potential negative consequences. Um, but at the time we decided to carry out this study, we really didn't have concrete numbers on kind of the prevalence of the use of journal impact factor in RPT processes. And we didn't really know how it was being used. We had a lot of anecdotal data, um, but we didn't have solid numbers on um, what's actually happening with this metric at the time that professors go up for promotion and tenure. Uh, so that was the motivation for this study to really be able to look at um, how often and how the metric is being used in evaluations. Um, and as I mentioned, this is part of a much larger study. Uh, so this was one run through the Skullcom lab um, uh, by Juan Pablo Alprin at Simon Fraser University um, together with me and a few other professors. I'll, I'll acknowledge them at the end. Um, and the goal of this larger project was really to kind of uncover the black box that is promotion and tenure evaluation, figure out what was in these documents. Um, because we thought, well, you know, before we can kind of talk about what needs to be changed, what reforms we would like to see, we have to know what's in the documents, what's getting evaluated and how. Um, so we did a, a big project to collect these documents. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, at the end, we came out with over 860 uh, documents that related to some uh, part of the pro review, promotion, and tenure process. Uh, it was 129 universities and 381 academic units um, across the U.S. and Canada. Um, and if you'd like to read more about the project itself, there's a link here on the slide, and I can also share these slides after the presentation. Um, it's a really nice blog post they put together at the Skullcom Lab with some infographics that talk about all the different uh, studies that we that we carried out as part of this larger uh, project. And of course, all the data are available. So um, we all, uh, as part of as participants in this project, really believe in in open science. Uh, and so uh, we published all our papers, open access, and also made all the data for this project uh, openly available on, on Harvard Dataverse. So if you'd like to go in there and, and play with the data, um, it's it's there and, and free for you to, to go in and dive in. Okay, so talking a little bit about the uh, study sample. So um, this was a stratified random sample. We wanted to make sure it was as representative as possible uh, to be able to make some kind of conclusions across that sample. Um, we used two classifications to pull from. One was the uh, 2015 edition of the Carnegie classification. So that's for institutions of higher education in the US. And then we used the 2016 edition of the McLean's University Rankings, and that is for Canadian-based institutions. And both of those um, classifications, they classify institutions as either doctoral research focused, which we're calling R-type, um, the master's or comprehensive, um, which is N-type, and then um, the bachelor's degree undergraduate level, uh, which is B-type. So we were able to divide by those types of institutions. And then within each of those, we also had um, subclassifications. So R1s, R2s, R3s, uh, et cetera. So it was nice for us to get um, kind of a breakdown. And then again, we did try to sample as much as we could across those different institution types to really get a, a representative sample. Um, and then finally, for the academic units, um, this is a little tricky because we know that there are different ways of classifying fields and subfields, um, but we use the taxonomy uh, put together by the National Academies. Um, so that groups disciplines into life sciences, physical sciences and mathematics and social sciences. So we were able to do that based on the documents we had coming in from each academic unit. 
Um, there were a few for which the classification was difficult. Um, and so in those cases, what we did was classify them as um, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, um, if we couldn't kind of neatly fit them into a disciplinary box. Um, so that's a little bit about what our, our sample looked like. Uh, I would say <laughs> one of the most challenging parts of this project was um, collecting the documents. Uh, so as some of you might know, um, promotion and tenure processes are not the most open processes. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of these documents are not necessarily public or they're kind of buried in um, uh, not standard places within, within the websites or within the departmental um, sites. And so uh, we hoped to crowdsource this at the beginning. Um, we put out calls on social media, on various kind of uh, Skullcom mailing lists, um, hoping that people would say, oh yeah, here's my department's document and, and send those in to us. Um, this did not work. <laughs> we did not uh, get a good amount of documents um, with that technique. Uh, so we had to kind of change tactics. Um, at that point, we started uh, performing kind of systematic web searches based on our, our, our stratified uh, random sample list um, to find some of the documents that were public. Again, this was tricky because they were not always in the same place within an institution's website. Um, but eventually we were able to track down quite a few documents uh, that way. Most of those were at the institutional level. So things like faculty handbooks, um, that sort of document. Um, it didn't work as well uh, sometimes for getting the departmental level documents. So in that uh, respect, what we decided to do was um, find public email addresses of faculty at those target institutions and email them to request documents from specific academic units that we were looking to um, sample from. Uh, that was <laughs> over 900 emails that uh, we sent out. Um, so again, this was a, a, a pretty kind of, um, I'd say laborious process in, in, in that respect. Um, but with that mixed approach, with a little bit of crowdsourcing, with those systematic web searches, and then with targeted emails, we managed to eventually collect those 864 documents, again, from 129 institutions and 381 academic unit. So eventually we got a really good size sample. Um, but I would, I guess that'd be one of my recommendations is uh, probably if you want to do this type of study, just relying on a crowdsource approach um, didn't really work for us. Um, in terms of the analysis, um, we did a quantitative qualitative analysis for, for this study. So um, we took those documents that we had been able to collect, and we loaded them into QSR International's NVivo. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with this software. Um, it's great. It allowed us to quickly search those documents and pull out any um, that had mentions of the word uh, impact or journal. We did that as a first pass to kind of find um, that subset of documents. And then what we did was read through a lot of those mentions. So um, in that case, there's kind of no substitute for the human element here. Um, we really did need to read through a lot of the documents to get a sense of what are the terms that they're using. Um, and that allowed us to identify specific terms that then we could uh, further analyze. Um, and I'll talk about those specific terms in a, in a moment, but reading through those and finding um, what were the terms that were repeatedly getting used, that allowed us to form three groups of terms. Um, and we only analyzed terms in the first two. Um, I'll, I'll talk about those again in a minute. Um, the third group we felt was a little bit more abstract, a little bit less concrete. And so we didn't analyze that third group. Um, so we just stuck to the really concrete terms in the first two. Um, and for the quantitative analysis, what we did was uh, consider that an institution has made a mention of, of one of these terms, if the term was present in at least one document from that institution or any of its academic units. So um, we did this uh, because we didn't want to kind of overrepresent an institution or, um, you know, we, we sometimes had several 
documents from several academic units from a single institution. And uh, we might see them mentioned in, in multiple, multiple academic units. Uh, so we just considered, you know, the, the institutional level for that. Uh, and that was our, our quantitative analysis, just to get a, uh, an idea of, again, what is the prevalence of the use of journal impact factor across these documents, across these institutions, and then break it down by institution type. And then the second thing we wanted to do uh, was qualitative analysis. I'll talk about that in a moment, but, but first the terms. So again, what we did was do this first pass where we read over the documents and found what are the terms that are getting used most often that refer to journal impact factor. So we have three rings here. This top level are those terms that refer directly to journal impact factor. So impact factor, impact score, impact metric, and impact index. Uh, so we considered those to be direct mentions. Uh, in the second ring, we had uh, other terms that again, we did think that those referred to journal impact factor. So high impact journal, impact of the journal or journal's impact. We found those uh, mentioned throughout the documents. And then finally, we have this third tier uh, that, as I mentioned, was a little bit more nebulous, a little bit more abstract. We think that those are probable references to the journal impact factor, but because it's not as concrete, we decided to restrict the analysis to these first two levels. So that third level, we had all kinds of terms like top tier journal and high ranking journal and high quality and prestigious journal. Uh, these are again, terms that we think are probable mentions. It's kind of the, the iceberg underneath this, this tip in groups one and two. Uh, but again, because we didn't consider them necessarily as concrete as the first two groups, we, we didn't analyze the prevalence of these two. We stuck to the, to the first two. Okay, and as I mentioned, we, we also wanted to do a quantitative uh, qualitative analysis. So not just how often are these terms um, present, but what's the context in which they're being used? And can we pull from that context some information about how folks are using the metric? So what we did in that, in that was again, use NVivo to export and then pull some of the text manually. So we exported as much as we could of the surrounding texts with NVivo. Some of those uh, came out a bit incomplete, and so we would have to manually pull the rest of the text. But because it wasn't a huge amount of documents by that point, that was that was feasible. So we pulled the text that was surrounding each of these uh, key terms that we saw in the, in the previous slide in the first two groups, and we analyzed the the text surrounding that. So. For this, what we did was read over the full mention with that surrounding text. And we classified each of those mentions as either supportive of the use of journal impact factor, cautious, or neutral. Uh, and then the second thing we did was classify whether they were associating the journal impact factor with something like quality, uh, impact, or importance, or significance of the work, and then prestige or reputation. Uh, to do this, obviously, we had to, again, introduce a human element. So we used two uh, independent raters. They read through the text, did their own rating. Um, and for 86% of mentions, they agreed on the rating. And then for those 14% of cases where there wasn't an agreement, we used a third uh, rater for a, a tiebreaker. So that's how we decided uh, whether those mentions, again, were supportive, cautious, or neutral or uh, whether they, and, and whether they associated the journal impact factor with quality impact or prestige or something related to those uh, concepts. So I mentioned we have open data online, but we also provided a supplemental uh, document. We couldn't share the RPT documents themselves because of course the copyright belongs to the institutions. Uh, but what we did was pull out text from those and put a document alongside the paper that showed each one of the dimensions and we color coded. So any of the terms that were in our coding terminology were blue, uh, any related with quality were red, et cetera, magenta is prestige, reputation, or status. We consider, considered those three terms to be uh, related to one another. 
Orange was the impact, importance, or significance. And again, we considered those terms to be, to be related. And then finally, in green, we wanted to particularly flag those statements that were questioning or discouraging the use of journal impact factor. And so that was a very visual way for us to provide the, the data for folks and have them be able to see at a glance how often certain terms were being used and how often this metric was being associated with certain uh, concepts. So here's a couple of examples. So this is a, an example of a supportive mention. Uh, so you can see the term here being pulled out as impact factors. And then there's a couple of associations within this block of text with the, with the concept of quality. So it says the quality of the journals will be assessed by their average impact factors. This was a pretty clear uh, concrete uh, mention. So in terms of sentiment, we qualified that as supportive of the use of journal impact factor. And then uh, in terms of what it claims to measure, uh, we said that it was claiming to measure quality. So again, we you can check this document here, but we did this for all of the mentions that, that we found uh, and we could see the, the different terms that were associated there. And here's a mention, uh, a very rare a cautious mention. Uh, you can also see a few things here. So there's a, a, an association with reputation and impact of the journal. There's an association with quality. Um, because this reputation link was a little bit less clear, uh, the final the final uh, determination here was was an association just with quality. So we were a bit stricter in terms of how we how we graded these, so to speak. So it didn't, you didn't just want to find the word, you wanted to see that the word was strictly associated with the metric. Uh, and here's the piece that's really interesting. So it says impact factors of journals should not be used as the sole or deciding criteria in assessing quality. So we, we considered that to be a cautious mention. Uh, and again, these were very rare, which is why we decided to kind of mark those out visually uh, so that folks could see where those were occurring. So we did this for all of the mentions that we found. Uh, and these were the basic results. Um, so it's a breakdown here of both kind of the quantitative measure. So uh, how frequently are these terms being found across the sample of documents that we have. And then within the documents where we found mentions, are those mentions supportive, cautionary, neutral? Uh, and then what do institutions or departments think that they're measuring with this metric? So in terms of prevalence, uh, you can see that overall, uh, so over the 129 institutions, again, we're, we're doing this at an institutional uh, level, um, not a document level, because some of the institutions would be overrepresented at the document level. Uh, 129 institutions, we found 30, so 23% where they had uh, mention of those strict um, terms that we have in groups one and two. Uh, and then if we break this down by institution type, so the, the doctoral or the research intensive universities, that was as high as 40%. Uh, for M type, that went down to 18. And then we didn't find any mentions in the uh, B type or the undergraduate level. Uh, institution. So that was kind of interesting that that was absent uh, in that institution type. But you can see here in the R-type institutions, it is uh, a pretty pretty good chunk there, 40% uh, of those institutions. Um, this number overall, I would say, was lower than we expected. But I think this might have to do in part with the methodology and the way that we chose to analyze the terms. So if we again think of those three uh, levels of terminology, uh, really in groups one and two, we have that tip of the iceberg. And probably if you analyze that third group, you would get a much larger percentage here. Um, and we do think that those terms, especially for many, many faculty, do indicate to them that, that we're talking about journal impact factor, even if it isn't explicit. Uh, so this number may be higher if you did do that analyst, uh, analysis of the, those uh, third group terms, but we really did want to be a bit more um, reserved and cautious with the way that we were we were analyzing. So this number was lower than we expected, but I think 
probably higher if you if you look at the rest of that iceberg, so to speak. Uh, in terms of the kind of quanti qualitative measures, so once we had the institutions for which we found mentions, we looked at those, uh, and again, with our independent raters, uh, rated whether they were supportive, cautious, or neutral. Uh, the overwhelming majority, 87%, were were supportive of uh, journal impact factor use. Very few were cautious. Uh, some were neutral, right? So we have 13% cautious, 17% neutral. I would say none of them were really, really strongly against the use of journal impact factors. That was interesting to us. So that's why we say cautious, uh, because they were, as, as I showed in that example, saying, well, it shouldn't be used as the sole measure. Right, but there were, we didn't find any documents that said you should not be using journal impact factor. Uh, and then finally, in terms of what they think the metric is measuring, by far uh, the largest percentage here was uh, the association with quality. So uh, departments or institutions think that they are measuring quality when they talk about journal impact factor. Uh, that's particularly I, I don't know if I want to say disturbing is the right word, uh, because we do have quite a few studies now that um, show not only is there not a link, but there actually might be a negative correlation between journal impact factor and, and quality. So uh, the fact that 63% of institutions are using this as a measure of quality is is definitely worrying. Uh, a good chunk, 40% as well, in, uh, associating journal impact factor with impact, importance, or significance of the work, of the research, or of the journal. And then finally, 20% uh, with prestige, reputation, or status. So, and then there was a good chunk here that were unspecified. So those were mentions that we found where people talked about using the metric, but they didn't necessarily associate it with any particular concept. They just had it there as a metric, uh, and then presumably it would be left open how that actually gets used uh, conceptually. So some interesting numbers here. And again, I think uh, there are methodological questions about should this number be higher if we if we analyze the third group of terms? Should we analyze the third group of terms? I think those are questions that I'd be happy to discuss with folks. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's basically what we found overall and the methodology we used. Uh, just a few quick acknowledgments. As I said, Juan Pablo Alperin at uh, Simon Fraser University was the was the lead PI on this study in Skullcom Lab. It ran through his uh, through his lab. Meredith Niles and Leslie Shemansky were uh, also co PIs on this project. And then, of course, for this particular study, Lisa Matias and, and Carol Munoz Nieves uh, were uh, two of the uh, folks that worked with us, especially on the pulling the documents through in, in vivo, coding, and all of that. So a huge thanks to all of them. And then our funding came from Open Society Foundation. So hugely grateful to them for several years of funding on this project. And in fact, extended uh, longer than we thought, because by the time we got this great sample of documents, we realized that there were a bunch of things that we wanted to analyze. Uh, so uh, we ended up looking at at several different factors. Uh, if you're interested, there's also a survey study that Meredith Niles led that uh, that talks about, you know, asking faculty at the institutions where we had RPTA documents, what are the deciding factors in terms of where you publish? Uh, journal impact factor obviously came up in that study, uh, but there were some interesting things there. Her, her main finding being that uh, when you ask faculty, they think all their colleagues are looking or are focusing only on prestige and things like impact factor, but that they are actually focused on the audience or the readership of the journal. So some interesting uh, findings there and definitely would encourage you to look again at the Skullcom page where we have a breakdown of the of the full study. So I think I will stop there. Uh, Tracy, if I remember, it was about half uh, and then we have plenty of time for questions and discussion.